Yes. <laughs> okay. Let's get started. Um, I'm Al Tyke, a uh, research professor here at the Center for uh, International Science and Technology Policy at George Washington University's Elliott School, which is where you are now. And I want to welcome you on behalf of our center and the uh, Center for Science and Democracy of the Union of Concerned Scientists. They are co-sponsoring this event together with uh, George Washington University. Um, Sean Otto, our speaker here, is an award-winning science advocate. He's a writer. He's a man of many talents. I'm really uh, get to know him. He's quite a, quite an impressive guy, um, a writer, a teacher, and a speaker. And he's a co-founder of uh, ScienceDebate.org, and um, for which he received the uh, IEEE USA National Distinguished Public Service Award. Uh, he's advised science debate efforts in other countries as well. Uh, he's a novelist and a filmmaker. Uh, his uh, novel, Sins of Our Fathers, which is a literary thriller, was a finalist in the LA Times uh, Book Prize. And his film, um, The House of Sand and Fog, which is something I saw uh, actually several years ago before I met John, uh, it's a terrific film, and I would suggest it's, uh, it's available on Amazon and on YouTube, and I would suggest uh, that if you have a chance, you, uh, uh, you view it, rent it, and, and view it. It was nominated for three Academy Awards. Um, it stars uh, Jennifer Connelly and Ben Kingsley, and he was the uh, co-wrote the screenplay for it. Um, his latest book is the one that you see displayed up here and outside on the table called The War on Science, and that's what he's talking about today. Sean lives in, um, in Minnesota uh, and has an environmental house, um, solar and, uh, is it wind powered too? <laughs> Solar and wind powered, and um, as I said, he's a very interesting guy. He's gonna the way we're gonna do this. Sean is going to do a um, a PowerPoint presentation, and then he and I are going to have a conversation, and we'll then open it up to a Q and A, and um, after that, uh, we'll have some time to uh, mingle and enjoy the refreshments that are left. So, uh, without uh, further uh, taking away from his time, let me give you Sean Otto. Thanks, Al. And thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, Representative McCollum uh, let me know that she's not sure if she can make it uh, due to the voting schedule uh, in Congress today. They're trying to move several bills. Uh, but we'll see if she'll be able to join us for the conversation later as well. Uh, so as Al mentioned, I was involved in an organization uh, called ScienceDebate.org, which uh, is still around, and I would encourage you to uh, sign on if you have not uh, as a supporter of Science Debate. It's basically a nonprofit 501c3 effort to get the candidates for president primarily, but also other public office in the United States to talk about the big science and technology health and environmental issues that face all of us. And as you'll see from my presentation, this is an issue that is only, only going to grow in importance uh, as we move forward in time. What I've uh, tried to focus on throughout the course of this is bridging a gap that exists uh, in large part between uh, what we're able to do uh, with science uh, and our ability to think and talk about it in our public policy process. Uh, and so that's uh, essentially kind of what the war on science uh, started out, uh, it grew out of that effort. Uh, the book is really an observation on the core relationship between science and democracy. Science is a great uh, 
force for equality, uh, and if you care about justice, you have to care about science and a democracy. Uh, and uh, it's uh, an effort to defend democracy from uh, a rise in authoritarianism. So uh, a number of people wonder uh, if there really is a war on science. At the American Association for the Advancement of Science meeting last fall, there was a, a panel questioning that, and I would put, I would, would spoiler alert, yeah, yes there is. <laughs> There's a war on science right now. Uh, and, uh, and I'd like to give you some examples from our politics. Politi politicians, by the way, are not causing the war on science. Uh, and, uh, and for reasons I'll explain in a little bit, science is not partisan here, uh, but they are uh, certainly participating in it. Two years old, two and a half years old, a child, a beautiful child, went to have the vaccine and came back and a week later got a tremendous fever, got very, very sick, now is autistic. So anti-science politics like this somehow, over the course of the last 20 years, have become completely acceptable in, uh, in American public dialogue. That's something that when I was a kid, for instance, uh, would not have been tolerated. Somebody made a statement that was blatantly, that blatantly flew in the face of what we know from science. That would pretty much be the end of their political career. That doesn't happen anymore. And the reason that it doesn't uh, leads us to a curious examination of really what is going on in American politics and why that could be. What has changed in the public and the public's view of science to make that possible? Now, it's not just happening on the right, uh, although many uh, in the science community seem to think that it is, uh, but uh, it's also happening sometimes on the left, and I'll show some examples of that. Uh, Bernie Sanders, for instance, has the most aggressive climate plan uh, of all the candidates for president and is broadly uh, embraced and supported by climate scientists. Uh, at the same time, though, he's against nuclear power. Uh, he supports alternative medicine, uh, and he's for GMO labeling, all of which have nuances uh, and elements of them that are not anti-science, but that are informed often by a lot of anti-science beliefs, like the idea, not supported by science, that genetically modified crops are not healthy to eat. This isn't just happening in presidential races, it's also happening in Congress. Consider uh, Congressman Chimkus, uh, who's chairman of the House Subcommittee on Environment and the Economy, uh, in, as he's uh, participating in this hearing on climate change. The earth will end only when God declares it's time to be over. Uh, man will not destroy this earth. This earth will not be destroyed by a flood. Um, and I appreciate having panelists here who are men of faith, and we can get into the theological discourse of, of that position, but I do believe God's word is infallible, unchanging, perfect. Uh, two other issues, Mr. Chairman. Today we have about 388 parts per million in the atmosphere. I think in the age of the dinosaurs where we had most flora and fauna, we were probably at 4,000 parts per million. There is a theological debate that this is a carbon star planet. Now, I don't know how many of you noticed the gilded scientific report that he was waving in his hand there, but the question is uh, why uh, in a committee hearing uh, where we are discussing matters of national import, uh, presumably uh, talking about evidence, uh, is he waving a Bible to begin with? Uh, why go to ideology instead of evidence? And why is that a, uh, an authority uh, in this particular case? Uh, my father read the Bible to our family when I was a kid over the dinner table for about a year, and I don't recall the part about carbon in the Bible. <laughs> Maybe I just missed it that day. Uh, this is all happening, also happening in, in state legislatures across the country. Here's a rather famous example from a couple of years ago where the North Carolina legislature banned sea level rise. Uh, <laughs> this was essentially uh, a move, uh, again, uh, in the climate war, uh, and, uh, but it's a problem because it was more reminiscent of, say, Mao's China than uh, the United States, where uh, local officials had to go to the uh, state legislature and the central state uh, government in order to get approval uh, and use the numbers that they provided, not actual numbers from science, when making zoning decisions, uh, roadbed height decisions, and things like that uh, uh, in development uh, close to the ocean. 
this is also happening uh, in city governments. Uh, for instance, uh, Snowmass uh, last uh, summer uh, banned fluoride, the use of fluoride, over concerns that it, uh, it might be a, a bad for your health. Uh, CDC considers it one of the greatest public health advances of the 20th century. Uh, it's not just in the United States, though. Uh, Anti-science like this, uh, beliefs or, or public policies that are co completely contradicted by the evidence is really spreading worldwide. Uh, Canada, during the Harper administration, uh, who patterned uh, uh, a lot of their policies on some of the Bush administration policies uh, by limiting what scientists could say and, uh, and their interactions with the press and placing ideological appointees over them and closing uh, libraries and scientific uh, enterprises uh, it engendered a demonstration uh, on their Capitol Hill in Ottawa uh, uh, talking about no science, no evidence, no truth, no democracy. It was a mock funeral for uh, democracy and science. Uh, but uh, this, is all, this also has happening in Australia where uh, cities uh, representing uh, about uh, half a million people have recently banned fluoride in France where there are new outbreaks of measles because of the low vaccination rates over fears about autism. Uh, the United Kingdom uh, also has a resurgence of problems with uh, the anti-vaccine movement. The United Kingdom is, of course, the birthplace of the anti-vaccine movement. Uh, Poland and Germany, where there's a resurgence of teaching of creationism in uh, public school uh, science classes. Uh, Ireland, uh, where Dublin also banned fluoride. Israel, where the health minister, who does not have a background in science, uh, recently banned fluoride for the entire country. Uh, Nigeria, where of course groups like Boko Haram, uh, whose very name means Western knowledge is forbidden, uh, are reacting uh, in, a, uh, in their version of a right-wing uh, reaction against science. Uh, and China, uh, where there's a burgeoning environmental movement, uh, and uh, at the same time a burgeoning movement against uh, genetically modified crops, which are seen as some kind of stocking horse from the West. So why is this spreading? Particularly why is it spreading throughout uh, many times uh, Western democracies which have traditionally been associated with science, with freedom, with free thought, with critical thinking, with individual rights, all of those things that seem to have been associated with science. There's something happening that's quite odd here and that's what uh, this exploration uh, tries to get at. Uh, and the best place to start is really understanding why it matters. So science, as I said a moment ago, is really the great equalizer. It is the one thing that stands between, say, two brothers with as much power as these two brothers have, Charles and David Koch, uh, and two brothers that have as much as these two have, my nephews in Chicago. Now, in theory, uh, these two sets of brothers uh, in the United States should have uh, the same access to justice, the same access to uh, potentially to education or to employment, uh, or at least to voting. Uh, and science is the one equalizer that neutralizes the vast size of the megaphone of the brothers on the left side of the screen uh, and provides an opportunity uh, to the brothers on the right. This is based on some core ideas that really date back to the very, very founding of the United States. Thomas Jefferson said, wherever the people are well informed, they can be trusted with their own government. And there is really the crux of some of the problem that we're running into. If you uh, have ever been down to the Library of Congress, you will have seen probably uh, Thomas Jefferson's library that's recreated there. Nice round space, round bookcases, and which contained uh, virtually the entirety of human knowledge at the time. And he had read all of those books and contained that in his mind. He was a scientist and an attorney, uh, sort of like Francis Bacon was. Uh, and that was a possible idea back then, the well-informed voter. But what happens now, nearly a quarter, cent uh, nearly a, a quarter millennia later, uh, when science has continued to advance and it's not at all possible for one person to know even a fraction of all that there is to know. How do we have well-informed voters that are able to govern themselves successfully in a democracy uh, 
in the age dominated by complex science and technology. That's the rub that we're bumping up against. Well, in order to come up with this idea for democracy, to convince other Enlightenment nations to not intercede in the Revolutionary War, Jefferson reached for the greatest thinking of what he called his trinity of three greatest men to come up with an argument that would convince him to stay out. He went to the thinking of Isaac Newton, uh, inventor at the time of physics, who said a man may imagine things that are false, but he can only understand things that are true. And this is part of where we're getting into trouble today. Because if you take out your cell phone and turn it over and unscrew the Phillips screws that are on the back, wait a minute, there are no Phillips screws on the back. It's hard to have know-how. It's hard to understand things that are true when science and technology have become so complex that it's difficult for the average person to break them down. A generation ago, you could sit down at your uh, kitchen table and you could buy a kit and you could make a radio. That's no longer true with cell phones. So at the moment that, that cell phones, which like flying brooms are made by people cloistered away wearing long robes and uttering strange incantations, right? At the moment that science becomes indistinguishable from magic, we become vulnerable to disinformation campaigns because science by its very nature must become uh, in a way a function of belief. Then it's what do you believe in? Scientists choose to believe in journals and the peer review process. But even those are vulnerable, as we've seen lately, uh, from certain for-profit journals and journals for hire. Jefferson next turned to Francis Bacon. Like him, both a scientist and an attorney, the Attorney General of England, who sought to circumscribe the power of the king, of the monarch. Uh, and uh, he ver worked very hard to build a lot of the core ideas uh, that, that Jefferson relied on in creating democracy. And he said that what a man had rather were true, he more readily believes, which is one of the reasons that he worked hard to create inductive reasoning and the method that we came to call uh, Western science, drawing, of course, on Ibn al-Haytham and, and other Muslim scholars that had uh, worked on, on developing observational-based science before that. But he saw that as a way to guard against confirmation bias, our tendency to see what we want in the environment. And instead of starting like Descartes did, from the top down, our thinking, I, I think, therefore I am, start with nature and see what nature has to say about it and confirm your observations there and build up from that. And then Jefferson turned to uh, a man that conservatives really uh, appreciate these days, John Locke. And John Locke, uh, aside from his uh, uh, conservative, uh, by today's standards, credentials, also uh, was seeking to solve a problem. He looked at all the uh, factions of Protestantism that were uh, happening that had broken down and were arguing with one another over who had the true path to God, who had the real knowledge. And he decided that there must be a way to really know what is real, what is knowledge, versus, as he called it, but faith or opinion. So he came up with three tests, intuitive knowledge, things like two plus two is four, you know, or that, here we go, we've got two and two, put them together, that's four. We can see it intuitively. Uh, there's no arguing with it. The next firmest form of knowledge is demonstrative. For instance, uh, a feather and a penny fall at different rates. Uh, I put them in a vacuum tube, I suck out all the air, and then they fall at the same rate. Therefore, I can conclude that air has an effect on the way that gravity acts on these different objects. So that's, I built that up from intuitive knowledge, made a deduction or an induction, uh, did an experiment, and combined them all to create demonstrative, demonstrative knowledge. And finally, his third was sensitive knowledge. I smell a rose. I look around for a rose, but I might be deceived uh, because I might just be smelling perfume. So sensitive knowledge, our common sense, was the least reliable form of knowledge, the kind that most often deceived us, the weakest. And anything that fell short of one of these was but faith or opinion. In other words, anybody could argue about it, much like we have 
varying factions in political in the political sphere arguing endlessly with one another now that science has begun to break down in society. So finally, to guard against that, he said that every argument should be argued in a way that was similar to a mathematical theorem, uh, grounding the mind or bringing the mind to the source on which it bottoms. And that's what Jefferson really sought to do in, in uh, writing the Declaration of Independence because his life uh, really hung on it. And it was really these essential ideas combined that led to the core functioning idea that informed the United States which was that if anyone can discover the truth for him or herself using the tools of reason and science, then no pope, no monarch, no wealthy lord has any more authority to govern us than we do ourselves. And that was an argument for a crowdsourced enlightenment reason to support uh, this new form of government called democracy. Without science, the United States would not have been here. So our whole system is dependent on this kind of thinking. Now Jefferson himself fell into common traps and thought uh, that we all fall into. Habit. This kind of thinking is not intuitive. It's difficult. Uh, here's an early draft of the Declaration of Independence. And you'll notice that in the top of the second paragraph he wrote, we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable that all men are created equal. That doesn't sound quite right, does it? What he was doing there was he fell into a mistake, a mistake of thinking uh, in appeal to the divine. We hold these truths to be sacred and, and undeniable. The moment he did that, he opened the United States up, the argument up to anyone who had a different faith to argue that no, Theirs was the more sacred and un un undeniable truth. They had a greater authority. He violated John Locke's idea of knowledge. Benjamin Franklin, who was our leading scientist at the time, took a look at the draft. He gave it to him, and Franklin made those backslashes, that edit. And that's Franklin's handwriting, writing in the words, self-evident, which he was quoting from his friend David Hume. So in this edit, it's arguably the most important edit in the history of the United States because it narrowly circumscribed democracy as a secular form of government that was independent of and non-judgmental towards religion. It did not make a religious appeal and neither did it judge religion. So in Jefferson's thinking then, democracy really had a virtuous circle. It began with some governance issue. Then we would turn to the educated and informed mass of the people from whom we would draw the uh, Congress. And that educated and informed mass of people would commission scientific research as Jefferson did uh, with the Lewis and Clark expedition to build knowledge about that governance issue. And then based on that knowledge, Congress would debate the best policy response. That's the way it was supposed to work. But what's been happening over the last uh, 40 to 50 years, and I'll show you how exactly and why, we've had some corruption of that process. Instead of the educated and informed mass of the people, vested interests seek to provide alternative theories to children and propaganda to adults. For instance, uh, seeking to teach that not evolution but creationism is really the way that uh, human beings came to be. Then, based on that, instead of turning to scientific research to build knowledge, we turn to authority and ideology for knowledge. As much as Representative Shimkus was when he was waving that gilded scientific report. Mm -hmm. Then, instead of debating the best policy based on that knowledge, we debate it based on dogma. And that's a formula for transforming democracy into authoritarianism. Because at that point then, who writes the dogma? The person with the biggest megaphone. Instead of turning to knowledge that any one of us citizens can generate, we turn to received wisdom from those already in authority. But this is not a conservative or progressive problem in specific. Science is not partisan, but 
Science is always political. And that's a really important distinguish, uh, distinction to keep in mind. The reason is that science creates knowledge. And as Francis Bacon said, knowledge is power because it gives you the ability to act in the real world, to change the world. And when you do that, you are going to either confirm or disrupt somebody's vested interests. And that is always a political process. Also, new knowledge about an issue, for instance, when and how life begins, causes us to refine our moral, ethical, and legal and policy codes in order to respond to that new knowledge. And that is inherently a political process as well. So there is an economic disruption and an ideological disruption that science often poses. And we'll see that that is driving much of what we're experiencing right now. So instead of a left-right continuum of politics, I would invite you to think about politics more as a plane, with uh, certainly a left-right continuum between left-wing and right-wing, uh, and also a top-down continuum between anti-authoritarian and authoritarian. Science is never partisan because it is both conservative and progressive. A scientist is always going to research what has been established before, that tradition, if you will, before they publish on something or they could embarrass themselves. But they are also always going to be open to the frontier where new knowledge is happening, the progressive end of things, because that's how you make your career. So it's about protecting yourself and making your career. You have to be both. But science is decidedly an anti-authoritarian occupation. It takes nothing on faith by its nature. It says, show me the evidence, and I will judge for myself. So science does take a position politically, though not in a partisan way. Now, if you think about American politics in terms of this plane, it becomes possible to imagine that there could be such a thing as a liberal conservative. And in fact, there once were. Uh, and there probably still are. It's just hard to talk right now if you're a liberal conservative uh, because we are so used to hearing about these things as opposite ends of a spectrum. But liberal really means uh, open to evidence, open to exploration. Uh, and, uh, and conservative uh, is not exclusive of that. What I would argue is going on in American politics right now, particularly in the Republican Party, is more of this argument over authoritarianism and the rise of authoritarianism. Uh, and those who uh, uh, view policy as being dictated by authoritarian sources and those who don't. But this isn't just happening on, for instance, climate change or vaccines or evolution. It's happening on a wide range of topics uh, that are emerging because of emerging science. Uh, this globe with all these blue lines uh, represent Facebook connections. Uh, you'll notice, for instance, that China is dark. We call that the Great Firewall of China. They block Facebook. Um, but uh, they might as well represent uh, connections between scientists working over the internet uh, who are no longer geographically, geographically constrained to work in the same lab in the same location at the same time. At the same time, we have vastly increased the number of scientists working through our university education system uh, in the last uh, 30 to 40 years. So now we have a vast number, an increase in the number of scientists and a vast increase in the quality of their working together to the point that over the next 40 years, we will be creating as much new knowledge as we have since the beginning of the scientific revolution. Now, if you think about that, and you think about some of the issues listed in this slide, and how many of our past scientific discoveries have engendered large political discussions and conflict and gridlock because of the moral and ethical implications they've posed or because of the economic disruptions they've posed, uh, we could be in for a very rocky next half century. And we certainly need to find a new system, a better system, even incorporating complex scientific information into our policy dialogue in a democracy, uh, the system is starting to break down and we need to find a new strategy. So the question emerges, are the people still well enough informed to be trusted with their own government? <laughs>
is uh, th this picture works particularly well with both signs, I think. You need them both. Um, this guy uh, is going to be voting on all of these issues. And it becomes easy to see uh, that we have an issue with outreach, with education, uh, with that well-informed voter. Uh, judging from Congress, uh, there they are, all working hard on their laptops. The answer is probably not. Of the 535 members of Congress, there are only 11 of them that have a professional background in science. It's according to the Congressional Research Survey. Uh, one microbiologist, one physicist, one chemist, and eight engineers. I know some of the pure scientists in the room might take issue with the eight engineers. Randy, I'm sorry, but I'm not going there, except for a cheap joke. Uh, by comparison, how many do you suppose are lawyers who mostly duck science classes in college? Huh? 400? <laughs> <laughs> wow, <laughs> we got some cynics in this audience here. Uh, but you're not far off, sadly. It's 211, or 40%. 40% of Congress are attorneys. Now, this is important because attorneys approach problems of fact in a distinctly different way. They use science, of course, uh, but they don't start from the ground up and see where the evidence leads. They start with a predetermined conclusion that they seek to convince you of and then they selectively use the science uh, that supports that conclusion. Uh, and they'll certainly research all the other science and they're aware of it so that they can argue against it. Uh, but that becomes a problem when more and more issues have vast inputs of knowledge from science itself. Uh, these people are not necessarily well equipped to make uh, the best decisions uh, in, in that case especially since uh, Congress has abolished its science advisory body, the Office of Technology Assessment. Uh, not abolished, defunded, I guess I should be fair. Um, but it hasn't come back in about 20 years. Uh, and uh, that's, a, that's an issue uh, only to the extent that, that you know, members now rely on lobbyists and the internet. Fortunately, those two sources always tell the truth, so I think we'll probably be okay. But. Uh, but to the extent that they don't, we're in trouble. So where is, this, where is this battle coming from? In order to understand that, we first really need to understand what's driving it in society, because those are, those are the action points where anti-science campaigns can move uh, people. So let's take a quick look at the broader narrative line of US science politics. I'm really talking about the emotional movements here, uh, the, the public's attitude about science. And, the, the lines are red and blue for a reason, as you will see in a moment. Uh, a little over 100 years ago, science uh, was really quickly commercialized. Uh, new technology was developed, a lot of engineering was done based on science, and uh, vast fortunes were made. So it was a source of great economic growth, of pride, of new jobs, of an American can-do attitude. Uh, and it had, uh, it enjoyed, aside from uh, certain Democrats like William Jennings Bryan, who uh, campaigned against uh, evolution uh, for its uh, destroying the moral underpinnings of society, uh, otherwise uh, most people had favorable attitudes towards science because of this. But then uh, something happened around uh, 1945. Uh, with the explosion of the atomic bomb, and uh, that led the United States into a great moral reflection in the immediate post-war years, uh, with a lot of uh, even uh, military generals uh, talking about how they felt we'd become intellectual giants but moral and ethical infants. Uh, there was a, a lot of discussion about whether or not uh, we had overstepped our ability to self-govern, uh, with our ability uh, to technologize, uh, and whether uh, we had made a big mistake. Uh, additionally, uh, there was a lot of fear that began to happen, particularly in 1949 after the Soviet Union uh, ignited their uh, atom bomb. And the possibility that this could come back, boomerang back, and uh, haunt, you know, and kill our population uh, began to haunt a lot of Americans. And there was a generation, uh, and many of you in this room, I'm sure, will recall those duck and cover movies and growing up with the idea that you could be annihilated at any moment. Uh, that fear really crystallized in uh, 1957 with uh, the launch of Sputnik. Uh, and uh, for the first time, Vannevar Bush's idea that we should have a peacetime investment in science uh, was finally funded. And the National Science Foundation uh, received money 
uh, and began to uh, fund government science uh, in peacetime. Uh, this also led to a big uh, race, not just a space race, but a science race in order to uh, beat the Soviets uh, to the moon and to establish American dominance. Now, this was not just a science objective, this was a political objective uh, that Kennedy set, using the tools of science to defend democracy as he apprehended that they really uh, stood to do. Uh, but something very interesting happened at that point in time. Uh, NSF and other government granting agencies had to develop uh, methods uh, of judging grant applications. Uh, and uh, otherwise, you know, you can't just grant taxpayer money willy-nilly, and if you send it to somebody that uh, has a goofball uh, uh, grant applications, you, you could open up the, the whole program to a lot of criticism, political problems. It was fraught with danger uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, so they developed uh, reasonably and rationally a system of uh, judging these grant applications that uh, were judged by other scientists. Um, but what they didn't do in the School of Unintended Consequences is provide for the same level of public engagement that scientists had had to make before then. Uh, in the years uh, prior to that, for instance, people like Edwin Hubble, uh, the cosmologist, would travel around the country and address standing room only crowds of 5,000 people talking about what he'd seen through that telescope on the top of Mount Wilson. And this kind of, of public engagement with science had happened uh, really for about 50 years. Uh, suddenly that began to transform because scientists really did not need to engage with the public in the same way in order to get much of their funding. Uh, much of it started funneling through universities, tenure system developed that also did not value public outreach, in fact had some strong disincentives against public outreach. So science became much more silent uh, starting in this period, uh, unintentionally and for good reason, uh, but with some consequences that we are now living with. Around the same time, this post-war period uh, saw a lot of other changes too, uh, particularly in the application of other uh, technologies that were developed during the war. Uh, for instance, the use of DDT, which protected uh, soldiers in the Pacific Islands from malaria, uh, was broadly used throughout the United States then. Uh, and this uh, broad use of chemicals uh, in the environment uh, led to Rachel Carson's Silent Spring in 1962. Uh, really the birth of environmental science and the environmental movement in a lot of ways. Uh, also, she became a massive target of a public relations campaign by uh, chemical companies and agrochemical companies uh, that uh, paralleled in many ways some of the attacks on climate scientists that we see today. Uh, so we saw a splitting off, really, of petrochemical companies uh, whose business models uh, that had developed prior to the war and during the war and that they were seeking to maintain the same level of production in peacetime now with this, these uh, domestic applications suddenly potentially being undermined by the new science that was coming out uh, started that, that Rachel Carson's book uh, was the tip of the iceberg for. Uh, so we saw the beginning of modern wars on science. Uh, about 10 years later, uh, fundamentalists uh, really started seeking, seeing objection, raising objection to our growing control over the human reproductive process. Uh, the pill was, uh, had been out uh, since uh, uh, 1960, roughly, uh, and uh, this cover of Time magazine here from 1978 talked about the test tube baby, and religious conservatives were debating whether or not test tube in vitro babies would have souls. Uh, to the extent that we know so far, they do seem to have souls, just like the rest of us. Uh, but this, uh, this uh, fundamentalist objection to origins science, be it origins of the cosmos or origins of us as human beings, was treading on God's turf. Uh, ironic, since Protestantism is really where much of Western science originally grew out of, that things had somewhat come full circle. Uh, but this discomfort between these two groups, petrochemical companies and religious conservatives, may start sounding familiar to you. Uh, in fact, the division between uh, old industry and old religion on one side and science and environmentalists on the other side came to define some of the basis uh, of our modern political party structure as uh, Democrats and Republicans realign themselves around these issues. 
Uh, today, uh, anti-science uh, is on the right is themed around the theme of creeping socialism. Uh, and it's generally directed at climate change, evolution, reproduction, and recently vaccines under two arguments. One is the HPV concern that uh, uh, eliminating uh, the uh, risk of cervical cancer is going to encourage young women to have sex. And the other is that uh, uh, the libertarian concern that the government doesn't have any business intruding in our bodies. On the left, uh, it's more about hidden dangers. Uh, and some, some of this is quite justified, uh, but uh, when it gets into anti-science, it's extending these concerns in ways that are not supported by the evidence. Uh, suspicion of mainstream medicine, or the, the idea that cell phones may cause brain cancer. I can tell you, based on physics, chemistry, and biology, that that's physically impossible. You don't have to worry about your cell phone. Or that vaccines may cause autism, that waste energy plants are driving climate change, that, uh, uh, you can, that EMF pollution is making you sick, or that fluoride in water is poisoning you, or again, that genetically modified crops are unsafe to eat. Now, there are other political issues around GMO, uh, about whether or not a company should control a genome, or about the broad use of pesticides, uh, but, there are, uh, but that has nothing to do with the science. Uh, there is no ingredient, if we're talking about GMO labeling, GMO is not an added to ingredient in food, it's just another way of, of breeding. Uh, in fact, interesting side note for those of you who don't know, um, you know, you can bombard seeds with uh, cancer-causing chemicals and radiation process called mutagenesis in order to get them to uh, change genetically. Uh, and then you can plant those, uh, those resulting uh, changed plants and you can call that organic. So, food for thought. Uh, the motivation on the right is largely anti-regulation, anti-reproductive control, and pro-corporate. On the left, the motivation is pro-environment, pro-choice, and anti-corporate. Is this all starting to sound familiar? The theme on the right is liberal scientists with a socialist agenda want to control your life and limit your freedom. So it's really about ultimate uh, individualism. And on the, on the left, it's impersonal doctors, greedy corporations, and mechanistic scientists hide the real dangers to health, the environment, and the spirit. The interesting thing is that since NSF, Scientists have really largely not participated in the public dialogue on this discussion. It's mostly happened among people who uh, are not working scientists. So this is occurring across three major battlefields. There is an identity politics war on science being fought in universities, an ideological war on science being fought by fundamentalists, and an industrial war on science being fought by corporations who don't like what science suggests about their profit structure. Uh, let's take just really quick brief looks at uh, the three of them and then we'll get to a couple of solutions and then Al and I will, will have a conversation and participate with you in that. Uh, the first is the identity politics war on science which really grew out again post-war about this idea that um, uh, all truth is subjective and uh, we should have suspicion of meta-narratives and meta-narratives are essentially uh, stories that groups in power uh, spin in order to retain power. And science is just one of those meta-narratives. Uh, science is therefore just another way of knowing, uh, equivalent with indigenous knowledge or alternative medicine or any other way of knowing that we have. Um, now, the, the problem with this thinking is that science itself uh, really is a method that is designed to strip what is true out of all of those individual sources of bias that uh, postmodernism really emphasizes. What is true away from our gender identity, away from our racial identity, away from our cultural or sexual or political or religious identity, so that we arrive at the kernel that is reliable no matter who does the measuring. That's what science was designed to do by going not to us but to nature. And that's where the humanities departments who are de being deposed by the science departments in terms of funding and prestige uh, got it wrong when they started arguing that science was uh, subjective. And that's where Thomas Kuhn got it wrong. Although Departments still point to Thomas Kuhn. I have a friend who teaches uh, screenwriting at a university and was sitting in a, in a classroom because he's on the tenure committee for uh, a, a teacher and he observed her sitting in the back and 
And she uh, was telling the students that we can't know for sure that the Earth goes around the sun. And he walked up to her afterwards and he said, that is just kind of a Socratic question, right? You're just, are you just trying to draw them out and get them to engage and be provocative, right? And she said, no, we can't really know that. We, we, how can we know that the Earth goes around? Haven't you read Thomas Kuhn? And Structure of Scientific Revolutions. It's all politics. Uh, he went to the tenure committee and said, you know, there's three of them. I can't vote for this person because she's really disseminating nonsense and she's not well equipping uh, people to be good citizens in democracy. How can I support her? And uh, they considered it and they backed her up because we can't know, according to them, uh, whether the earth goes around the sun. So this is not uh, fantasy. This is happening uh, in many universities uh, across the country right now. Uh, but it's decidedly wrong. Uh, and that's where uh, these professors uh, have become confused and laid down a philosophical groundwork over the last two generations that is being taken advantage of by disinformation campaigns. We really shouldn't believe anything unless it's supported by evidence. One area where this is really coming to fruition is in journalism, where journalism schools for the last two generations have taught that there's no such thing as objectivity. Uh, now, that may be a good, uh, it, it may be a good idea to embrace your own bias, to acknowledge that, to not say I'm voiding, v writing with a voice of objectivity when I do an article. And it's certainly important to empower disempowered voices because the more perspectives on a problem that science has, the more likely it is to arrive at the truth because it's been tested from a variety of different points of view. But that's not the same thing as saying that there's no such thing as objectivity. Here it is in the voice of San Diego New Reporter Guidelines. Not to pick on them, they're one of many, many publications who do the same thing, but there it is. No such thing as objectivity. Linda Ellerby on the speaking circuit, there's no such thing as objectivity. Even Nick Gillespie, the editor-in-chief of Reason.com, an objectivist publication, is saying that there's no such thing as objectivity. So we've got a problem in journalism. When journalism, journalists believe this, how are they going to be able to drill down and actually get at the objective facts and the objective truth of something? Are we devolving into a pre-John Locke era where all different parties are warring with one another with equal claims on what's true and what's not true, where it's only a matter of one's opinion? That's just your opinion we hear often on the news. Well, here, it is, here it is illustrated in journalism. Journalists will say that, you know, I'm a generalist. I'm not an expert on anything. There are always two sides to every story. I seek truth, but I also seek balance. And I seek, in order to, to present a balanced story, I will get two different points of view. I'll talk to a scientist, and then I'll talk to somebody standing in the corner and see what they think. And it's a more dynamic story if they don't agree. And the idea is, is that somehow you'll flush out the truth in that process. But it doesn't work that way if you're equating somebody speaking with knowledge on the one hand and some yahoo with an opinion on the other. Or worse, not a yahoo with an opinion, a very informed person seeking to in, uh, convince you of the rightness of their opinion that's contradicted by the evidence. So journalists will say there's always two sides to every story. Bob says two plus two is four. Julie says two plus two is six. The controversy rages. Right? You sell newspapers anyway. The scientists will say most times one side is objectively wrong. Even though the reporter says, well, Julie might have legitimate reasons for her perspective, the scientists will say, I can show you with these four apples that Bob is clearly right. It doesn't matter how Julie feels about it. And then, of course, you have politics. How about a compromise? And we get a new law saying that 2 plus 2 equals 5. And that's American politics in a nutshell these days. The problem with this is that it is reliant on the journalistic practice of false balance. This equation on one half of the screen of a scientist speaking with the accumulated experience of thousands of scientists conducting tens of thousands of experiments, working sometimes with billions of data points, representing all that knowledge to the public so that they can make an informed public policy decision. And on the other half of the screen you have somebody that is highly motivated to convince the public of the rightness of their position and they're probably much more articulate at it because the bar for them they feel is higher so they'll work as hard as they can to be convincing as possible. What that does in our public policy dialogue however it skews the whole dialogue towards more extreme positions by driving us away from what's supported by evidence and knowledge 
and inordinately uh, providing a voice to uh, knowledge that, or to opinion that is not supported by knowledge. All right. Then we've got the ideological war on science, which journalists often fail to take on because of this concern about balance or about selling newspapers. Uh, and this, too, in its modern form, uh, began uh, after it began in the post-war period. Although, uh, really, the ideological conflicts with science date back to uh, Galileo and the, and the priest that refused to even look through his telescope to see the evidence uh, that he was pointing to and talking about. But here, uh, after the Russians uh, detonated their bomb in 1949, uh, Billy Graham took to the road uh, and talked about uh, how society was going through a moral nosedive, how we're elevating man and we're taking God off of his uh, stool, and, uh, the, and society was beginning to crumble because of it. Uh, and it was all due to science. Uh, at the same time, we, uh, as science advanced, uh, a decade later, we had television and a lot of evangelicals saw this as a great opportunity to exercise uh, the commission of Matthew to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations and take advantage of this new medium of television to convert people to evangel evangelism and, in fact, to encourage them to run for office, uh, to instill evangelical values in democracy. Uh, James Dobson declared the 1990s a civil, uh, the, the beginning of a civil war on values. And recently, the other day, Franklin Graham, Billy Graham's son, was uh, preaching in St. Paul, where I was from, at the, on the Capitol, and he was encouraging people uh, to run for public office if they were pro-life and against gay marriage. Uh, he said that uh, society uh, is in a moral nosedive, uh, virtually... Uh, uh, echoing his father's words uh, from 1949. Uh, so some things uh, have not changed in the relationship between fundamentalists and science. Then there is an industrial war in science which journalists also fail to take on. Uh, and the industrial war in science tends to be about regulation. Uh, regulation where science has uh, provided us with some information that's been commercialized in some way or another. Uh, and then about 10 years down the road, it provides new information saying, wait a minute, we've got some unintended consequences here we ought to take a look at. We've got to regulate this. The business is built up on that. Uh, older science don't like that and seek to pr uh, protect their profit model. And we wind up with science fighting science. Uh, so there are all these different aspects of regulation where we see attacks by industry on scientists and on the known science uh, in these particular areas and in a few others. Uh, for example, in 1968, Stanford Research Institute, uh, which has uh, now become a private research institute, uh, was largely serving economic development for corporations, uh, they actually uh, did a study for the American Petroleum Institute, a final report, uh, talking about how significant temperature changes are almost certain to occur by the year 2000, and they could bring about climactic changes. This was 1968. I'd say they nailed it pretty well. And the uh, uh, petroleum companies that were members of the American Petroleum Institute uh, knew about this at that point in time. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, as the Kyoto Protocol was being discussed uh, to limit uh, carbon emissions, uh, a number of uh, oil companies and uh, other activists uh, in that same uh, vein, uh, public relations firms and others got together and created the Global Science Communications Action Plan. Uh, and they laid out what, uh, in 1998, what has now become uh, a series of very familiar talking points that we hear over and over, emphasizing, as you'll see here, the uncertainties. Uncertainties calling into question the validity of viewpoints or, or, or supporting the validity of viewpoints that challenge the current conventional wisdom. Um, there's more uncertainties. And uh, uh, <clears throat> appearing to, uh, making mainstream science appear to be out of touch with reality. To the extent that uh, we can cause a controversy, we can take advantage of the belief that debate is healthy. But it goes back to the false balance argument, because if one side of the debate is informed by knowledge and the other is informed by opinion or some other motivation, uh, it's not a fair fight. It's not an even-handed debate. Journalists, of course, feed into this because of their focus on balance, and that's why it was developed that way.
In 2008, we noticed the paucity of discussion of big science issues, and I'm coming right towards the end here, uh, uh, by these top five TV news anchors, uh, Matthew Chapman, uh, my co-founder at Science Debate, and four other people and I, uh, who noticed this. And uh, in fact, at that point in time, these five top anchors had conducted uh, 171 different interviews with the then candidates for president. They'd asked them nearly 3,000 questions. How many dispose mentioned the words global warming or climate change? Arguably the biggest economic and environmental question. Any guesses? Ten? I heard somebody else. Two? Oh, another cynic. You guys are stealing all my, all my material. Six. It was six. To put that in perspective, there were three questions about UFOs. <laughs> so that's the relative seriousness that the National Press Corps placed on this issue. Now you think, you know, okay, that's 2008. We've come a long way, right? We, come, we just had the Paris Climate Accords uh, uh, in uh, December of last year, November 30th to December 12th of last year, right? 195 different countries came together for the first time have an international accord to begin rebuilding the international economy and moving us slowly off of carbon. Uh, in the week following, uh, the Democrats and the Republicans both had presidential debates. One on CNN and one on ABC. How many questions do you suppose the journalists asked them uh, in the Republican debate about climate change? Zero, right. But how many do you suppose asked in the Democratic debate? One, two, five, zero, zero. So we really haven't made much progress in the intervening years, particularly when it comes to journalists and their ideas about uh, contentious issues that uh, have political uh, ramifications, but that are nevertheless driven and informed by the evidence, science, the foundation of democracy, and yet we can't talk about it. I don't care what, so what party you're with, if we don't base our decisions on evidence, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. Because nature doesn't care what party we are. This is a worldwide hoax and its primary target was you, the people of the United States of America, Rush Limbaugh says. James Inhofe, Senator, says the greatest hoax ever perpetrated on the American people. It's a money-making industry, okay, says Donald Trump. It's a hoax, a lot of it. In 1920, Weimar, Germany, similar comments were made. Right-wing relativity deniers attacked Albert Einstein's theory as a big hoax and Jewish science. These are terms that are commonly used by authoritarians when they seek to convince people that the wool is being pulled over their eyes and that everybody believes the way that I do, and this is a big hoax. This world is a strange madhouse, Einstein wrote a friend at the time. Currently, every coachman and every waiter is debating whether relativity theory is correct. Belief in this matter depends on political party affiliation. Sound familiar? Part four, winning the war. The book has several battle plans. I'm not going to go into all of them in detail here. I'm just going to skip over the surface of a couple of them. The first and most important thing is to realize that no matter, again, one's, uh, science is not partisan, no matter one's party affiliation, the great equalizer and uniter in democracy is science. It's evidence from science. And assertions against science are made usually by people whose position is not supported by the evidence. They are therefore authoritarian. One of the things that I suggest we look at is the National Center for Science and Self-Governments to promulgate policy, develop legal theory, and uh, model bills that protect democracy and that encourage a more robust democracy in an age when science is uh, having huge inputs into our policies. Uh, retraining the media in pro-evidence journalism and holding them to account as, for instance, Media Matters for America does by developing important metrics on uh, skewed public policy uh, reporting in the media. 
to provide that important back pressure on the media uh, to uh, consider evidence as part of uh, balanced reporting. Uh, as a friend of mine, Don Shelby, says he's a Peabody and M Emmy winning news anchor, really balanced reporting, this is what he tells reporters when he talks to them, is that you imagine it not as A and B, but as a set of scales. And you report on the side of the story that has the preponderance of the evidence, the weight of the evidence on that side. Granting bodies, uh, we can, there's a lot to do with reforming granting bodies, but requiring and funding 5% on lab outreach would be a really good start. Uh, so that we build in more uh, science communication for the health of democracy, for the robustness of democracy into the process. Because it's fine to extend science way out on narrow limbs of uh, chains of evidence, but if we are not bringing the rest of society with us, we're creating a gap that creates a weakened science enterprise. Uh, make knowledge more accessible and integrated. Uh, get it out of uh, some of the journals into a vast online journal that is broadly uh, searchable. Create model bills to tackle science denial and the myth of uh, shareholder value being the sole determinant of corporate performance. Uh, there is frankly no law that requires corporations to strictly maximize shareholder value. Uh, as uh, the Supreme Court recently uh, stated in, uh, in an opinion. Uh, focus on process versus outcomes in education. Uh, this is so important because it teaches people how to think and how to make that leap from, sure, it's fine to question everything, but then what do you replace it with? You have to go with evidence, not with the opinion of your best friend or your political cohort. Faith leaders. Uh, actually, I encourage them whenever I talk to faith leaders that they join the AAAS and that they equip their flocks uh, by, uh, for, to live in the modern age of science. We've got all these immense complex science and engineering issues that are facing us. They all have finely uh, tuned moral and ethical components that, uh, that priests and pastors, if they were scientifically literate, could actually have fascinating discussions helping people navigate this complex new world we're living in. Coordinating science and the scientific enterprise with disempowered groups because science really does uh, equate to civil rights. It's the foundation of the idea of civil rights and there is not enough of an emotional uh, and political connection there. And refuting the myth of the non-interdependent self, the idea that uh, my own actions are the only thing that I need to take into account. One last step you could do is, again, as I said, uh, sign on, support sciencedebate.org. This was a project created just by six people that went viral. Uh, within weeks it had 40 some thousand scientists and engineers sign on. Uh, in some ways it transformed uh, the science enterprise's relationship with politics and the way that certain people think about it. Uh, a couple hundred universities, dozens of Nobel laureates, members of Congress, CEOs of companies. Join them, you'd be in good company calling for candidates to talk about these things because if we get them in the public discussion, then we can trust in this beautiful process of democracy that we've developed to vet these, uh, th these ideas, this thinking, and move them forward. Uh, ScienceDebate.org uh, in 2008 and 2012 uh, held online exchanges between President Obama and his opponents, Senator McCain and Governor Romney. Uh, between those two efforts, we made nearly two billion media impressions uh, in newspapers and online publications and uh, news reports around the world, mostly in the United States, uh, creating coverage of these issues that hadn't uh, and probably wouldn't have been discussed uh, were it not for this issue. Uh, so uh, it really is true, that old adage, that a small group of uh, determined individuals can change the world. In fact, uh, President Obama quoted uh, our mission statement uh, in his inauguration speech and appointed several of our earliest and most ardent supporters uh, to his cabinet. Uh, so again, sciencedebate.org. In 1948, Albert Einstein sent a desperate telegram out to uh, friends, uh, supporters, and other people that he thought were of influence arguing essentially that they needed to support a new change in our dialogue uh, between America's relationship uh, and science. And I'm paraphrasing here, but essentially he argued everything has changed, save our ways of thinking. And I would suggest that we're still dealing with that same question. So thank you for listening and we'll, we'll have a discussion now.
There we go. I should also say that um, the TV crew uh, will, when it comes to a Q and A, they'll be bringing around a microphone that's not tied into the the uh, audio, so the PA system in the room, uh, but it's so they can pick up your question. Uh, so please um, uh, work with them on that and speak loudly. We should explain the uh, presence of the uh, TV cameras and all that uh, as well. This is uh, being uh, videotaped for um, Book TV, which is a C-SPAN production. Um, so the microphones are going to feed into the, uh, the audio feed for that uh, program. Um, okay, you've raised a lot of questions. I mean, I've been doing science policy for my whole career. I was the uh, head of science policy at AAAS before uh, coming here to, to GW, and a lot of these questions are familiar. Um, you're not a scientist. How did, how did you get into this business? I mean, I started out as a scientist, and then I got interested in policy and pursued that, but uh, I look at your resume and say, where, where is his interest in science? <laughs> yeah, I'm a bit of an odd duck that way. Um, <laughs> I actually, I, I, I studied kind of a combination of things, physics, neuroscience, and psychology in, in college. I wrote my own degree uh, at a school called McAllister College where you could do that uh, and maintained an interest in it, although a lot of my heroes were writers and I, I just uh, wanted to be a writer. Uh, and I pursued that, but uh, I became known in Hollywood as somebody who would write about science. And Matthew Chapman, who is a, a co-founder of ScienceDebate.org and uh, happens to be Charles Darwin's great-great-grandson, uh, is also a screenwriter. He wrote uh, the movie Runaway Jury, and uh, he's also a director. He directed the movie The Ledge. And uh, he and I were uh, up for adapting Walt Isaacson's biography of Albert Einstein. And then the Hollywood writer's strike came along, and uh, we were all without work. And we had a little bit of time on our hands, and we were very frustrated by the uh, low quality of the political discussion at that point in time and uh, how the candidates really weren't talking about any of the science, tech, health, or environmental challenges that we were facing. And from our point of view, those have uh, as large an impact as economic challenges or foreign policy challenges on everyone's daily lives. So we decided to try and do something about it, uh, which led us down a very twisty rabbit hole. Okay. Um. So you, um, you've written this book, which you've titled The War on Science, um, and you've described it a bit, but it sounds to me like there is, I mean, the, the term war on science suggests an organized opposition. Is this, a, are, we, are we science advocates uh, facing an organized opposition to science, or is this just coming from different quarters, as you described, in industry and in uh, um, right-wing politics. And it's both. Uh, it's both. It is organized, particularly the industrial war on science. Uh, there's a large network of uh, uh, grassroots uh, front groups that are being funded by uh, the energy industry uh, that follow a fairly prescribed strategy, a seven-step strategy that I lay out in the book. Uh, and for instance, Americans for Prosperity, uh, one of them, uh, founded by, uh, essentially, by the Koch brothers, uh, is four times the size of the Republican Party. Uh, so they carry uh, enormous weight in the American political conversation these days uh, and uh, have a specific objective that they're pushing. And why do you suppose they're doing this? What, what, is, their, what is their stake in this uh, in this business, how do you? Well, from, if you're an oil company, climate change is an existential issue. Uh, and particularly these days with uh, 17 attorneys general uh, going after uh, uh, energy companies, uh, investigating them and whether or not they uh, did in fact know that uh, uh, carbon products, fossil fuels were causing climate change in the 60s, 70s, uh, and uh, set about disinformation campaigns to defraud investors and the public. Uh, it's very much an existential issue with uh, multi-billion dollar and perhaps multi-trillion dollar uh, uh, questions hanging in the balance. I was in intrigued by your um, uh, raising the issue of false balance. Um, it's a, you know, I see this myself. Uh, and how do you, how do you get around this? Uh, how do you teach journalists? <laughs> 
uh, that uh, this is not. I mean, uh, this this is not the way to um, to serve the public interest. Yeah, it's, it's a big problem because a journalist uh, really is a generalist. Uh, they're not an expert in anything, and so uh, they would, in some ways, be irresponsible by portraying uh, their reportage as objective uh, when it's not. Um, they have to acknowledge their biases. Uh, but at the same time, where they're falling down, as I uh, point out to them whenever I have the opportunity, is uh, failing to consider the weight of the work of evidence. Uh, and uh, they need to balance their reporting by telling the story that is most supported by the evidence. And there are some people that I point to that do this very well in the book. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, st I talk with Stephanie Curtis, who is the producer of a program called The Climate Cast on uh, Minnesota Public Radio, which is actually distributed uh, in several markets around the country because it's the only uh, weekly radio show that actually uh, gets, uh, goes in depth in climate change and that doesn't get caught in the details of whether it's happening or not. And it turns out that once you get past that base level political question, the whole world opens up as far as the fascinating questions that you can get into about how El Nino affects uh, uh, lakes in the Midwest or weather patterns and things like that and uh, how we should be preparing for uh, coming changes. So it's actually uh, uh, an approach that could make meteorologists, for instance, uh, into almost anchor level positions. It could vastly increase their importance to their viewership because they are providing real solid information that people need to know. Um, this is a more speculative kind of question. Um, and I've, how, how do you think future scientific developments are likely to affect uh, the war on science and the opposition to the war on science? And um, uh, uh, to expand on that, um, our, um, is there a way to um, promote science in a direction that will help in uh, fighting this war on science? Yeah, well, war on science occurs in, in generally along two lines. One is that uh, line when uh, that has to do with um, short-circuiting democracy in order to forestall or curtail regulations uh, or bills that are going to affect your business or your bottom line. Uh, so it usually involves public relations campaigns in order to paralyze the process or to get people to vote one way or another uh, and to provide them with quote-unquote science that's cherry-picked that, that can throw up uncertainties to challenge uh, the, the traditional mainstream science. The other is the issue when science presents us with a moral quandary or with an area that uh, we need to, as, as knowledge advances, that we need to refine our moral and ethical understanding that always carries a debate and it always engenders uh, uh, concern from uh, religious conservatives who often are biblical literalists and don't like the idea of science telling us what to do, so that's intruding on God's territory. So I think that there are areas where that's uh, going to continue to happen, particularly the, the most fascinating area I think is the uh, emergence of knowledge in neuroscience and what that says about free will and the inner, inner relationship of neuroscience and computer science. Uh, because if people have only limited agency uh, and we uh, can define when they do and don't have agency and, and what the limits of that are, what does that say about our legal system and about holding people accountable for their actions? So I think that there are a lot of very interesting moral and ethical and legal and policy questions that we're going to be getting into in the next few years there is just one example. Very good. I think um, that's a good point at which to uh, open this up to uh, questions from the audience and I see one immediately and I see a gentleman over here with a microphone on a, uh, on a wand. Uh, My name is Li Yang. Thanks for your presentation. This is a certain a very good lecture, um, but I think instead of saying war on science, I think basically if we change the war science to justice and free <laughs> fairness. Mm -hmm. If we change substitute this world, then your non-political system will be all fit into this problem, whether you are a Republican or whether you are a Democrat. So if 
per, you, are, you just mentioned about a public comment and uh, the problem is uh, for profit corporation, whether that is individual or whether it is Koch brothers, the important thing is they use a profit, they hide a profit in their debate. So everything is really in terms of who get the most money, whether from the consumers right. or whether from the government. So if we can substitute this, especially now, if you see that Einstein, they want to label him mental ill instead of saying he is a great scientist. Right. Okay. So if we right. just change that wording about justice and fairness, then the whole thing we want to debate is fulfilling to that. So the importance is our that's people. A, that's a really important, good observation. Yeah, important is our people have to stand up. Don't allow them to control the microphone. Have right. to allow people to speak. Yes. Thanks for this. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank, thank you. you. It is about justice. Absolutely. And science is, uh, by creating evidence that is impartial, uh, is, of course, the foundation of not only our justice system, but our political system as well. And so I think that the emphasis on justice is actually a very good suggestion. Thank you. Over here. Uh, l let me remind you that these are questions, and in a question, your voice rises at the end, and it ends with a question mark. So, and... Uh, it should be no more than a short paragraph. Okay. Well, you, it's okay. You, you don't it's have okay. to lean down like I'm that. I'm really and, and sorry. that we can't, the, the, okay. the microphone is not uh, right. keyed into the right. PA system no, here. I, I, I'm just sorry that holistic medicine and genetically modified organisms were swept into some of what I would agree is really anti-science where evidence is denied. but. I, I would like to know what you're basing that on because as a medical researcher and a social scientist, I found that medical research did not meet social science standards. Often apples and oranges were mixed together and yet the authors claimed to have a definitive finding, say, about atherosclerosis when they had looked at plasma exchange, medications, very sick patients, mm -hmm. and still claimed to have a finding. And one last example would be the NIH's examination of vitamin C under pressure, but then um, they said, we're not going to look any further back than 1982. Social science tries to be as exhaustive as possible so you don't miss anything. So what, what research did you use to lump holistic medicine as an anti-science? Thank you. Okay, so I think if I understand it right, the question is what research did I use to lump holistic medicine in as an anti-science? Um, I, I don't think I said holistic, I said alternative, although if by holistic you're meaning things like homeopathy, for instance, um, there is no scientific evidence to show that homeopathy works. Um, if you, um, are, when you're talking about genetically modified uh, food, um, a lot of people are thinking that that genetically modified means some additional ingredient that we're adding to it or something like that. And all it is is actually a more precise form of plant breeding. Uh, and in some ways it is uh, safer uh, than uh, prior breeding methods. But where it gets into trouble, I think, and where there is a politically uh, uh, important issue is uh, how it's genetically modified and for what purposes. Uh, if it's genetically modified to save the papaya or to uh, prevent blindness, uh, then uh, those are good purposes that, like any tool, science is a tool, remember, uh, that uh, serve humanity. Uh, if it's genetically modified to uh, make plants withstand uh, uh, herbicides, uh, so, or, or not, herb well, some herbicides and uh, insecticides that are essentially borrowing from the environment uh, by creating other problems, then uh, generally there's probably going to be uh, some unintended consequences from that, and we're seeing that, and I talk about that in the book with the emergence of uh, superweeds. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a danger to uh, broadly say that uh, all GMO is bad to eat, which is what is often argued um, 
by those in the organic food movement, for instance. That's not true. Uh, there is a political, uh, legitimate political controversy about how it's applied. So over here. And then the gentleman next to you. My question, and it is a question, has to do with education. Where do we start? How do we start? I'm concerned about, not only on college campuses, about trigger warnings and um, the things that students get. Uh, they don't want to be upset. Yet, if you're going to truly learn, I think it, learning is fundamentally dangerous, in my opinion. Um, where, where do we start so that children and young people's minds are prepared, are opened, to receive information that might be controversial? Because I think that's the key to ending the war on science. Right. Yeah, good, good, good question. Uh, one of the things when I, that I, when I talk to teachers, I talk about process a lot and um, about uh, different techniques that you can use. Obviously, when you're, when you're teaching young students, you want to uh, co create cognitive dissonance. Uh, you want to elevate their level of concern uh, so that they're engaged. Uh, and then uh, science shows they're actually receptive to new information because it's a solution to a, a problem or the answer to a question that they've raised themselves in their own mind. Uh, well, what better way to raise concern than uh, to talk about politically contentious science issues? Uh, now, administrations often are uncomfortable around that, but uh, student science debates are a fantastic tool, uh, one that I often talk about. Um, taking co politically contentious uh, topics that are surrounding science, for instance, uh, uh, making a, an assertion, uh, vaccines do cause autism, uh, or that uh, climate change is human caused or is not human caused, something like that. Uh, and then assigning the students to research both sides of the question, but not telling them which side they're going to debate until the day of, in which case you flip a coin. Then the students actually learn for themselves uh, some of the more interesting differences between rhetorical arguments or uh, public uh, relations arguments and actual science. Uh, and they're equipped on both sides, and they kind of learn the difference. Uh, so that's one interesting tool that's actually a lot of fun uh, that doesn't have the teacher responsible for taking a position if the administration is uncomfortable about it. Another one that I like to do is working with students on uh, the fundamental questions, uh, like is something alive or not alive? Um, my wife used to be a science teacher, and she um, would use a, a unit to explore this with air ferns. Uh, which if you know, I'm not going to tell you whether air ferns are alive or not, you can research for yourselves, but, but they're sort of like viruses in that it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a fascinating area to begin to explore some of the fundamental questions about life and the universe. And if you can engage students in that um, and where the answer is not readily apparent and there are some twists and turns, uh, you can capture their imagination in a way that I think is very important because it's not about regurgitating the right answer, uh, which is not what science is. It's about an exploration of these big ideas that we're still grappling with. So those are two examples anyway. Um, hi, my name is Roger Oliva. I'm an engineer, so my background is um, science and physics Speak mostly. Speak a little louder, please. Okay. Uh, so I had a comment and a couple questions. The comment was the people that need to read your book aren't going to read your book. So, so that kind of leads me to my, my first question, which is you know, what can we do about it? And I think you answered the education piece perfectly. I mean, I think if you get students engaged, then that's, you know, that's a great way forward. But beyond student engagement, what does your book recommend that we do about it? And the second question is just, you know, I'll ask the second question in a minute, but... Okay. Well, first, let me apologize for the wisecrack about engineers at the top of the talk. <laughs> I was just having fun. Um, but, uh, all right. Uh, yes, uh, those who are uh, authoritarian by nature or who are uh, uh, predisposed uh, in uh, one perspective about, say, climate change, and they're going to assume that this is a book about climate change, which it's not, although it has a chapter that deals with the industrial war in science, which is often fought on the climate front now. Um, those people aren't going to probably pick it up. But 
their family members might, their friends might, uh, members of the media, I certainly hope will. Uh, and by equipping people with some tools uh, to think about this and to think about the and to be reminded of what they may have known and forgotten about the fundamental role of evidence and science in uh, democracy, um, I think we'll give those people tools to begin to change the conversation, to at least feel equipped to uh, challenge some of the pithy talking points that are being provided on a daily basis to the other side. That sounds right. I guess my, my other question was just what's the next book going to be? <laughs> uh, well, I'm actually, I'm curious, it's not... I'm, I'm exploring a topic right now that is pretty fascinating to me uh, about bear bile, actually, and about uh, urso deoxycholic acid, uh, which uh, was uh, discovered by a, a guy named Cliff Steer um, at uh, University of Minnesota. Uh, and uh, it uh, slows or stops cell aptosis, and it's an, it's an amazing uh, chemical compound that's manufactured by microorganisms in in our gut, uh, and it appears in very, very high levels in, in bear bile. And no, bear, bear bile. But for, for a variety of reasons, uh, even though it can, it's, a, it's kind of a wonder drug that can treat uh, Parkinson's and, and uh, uh, ALS and uh, all kinds of uh, degenerative is, is, uh, health issues, uh, it's not being produced because of the structure of our pharmaceutical system. Sounds like alternative uh, medicine. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the other fascinating part about it is that uh, that uh, uh, it involves the Chinese mafia. Uh, I mean, the bears are uh, bears have been kind of uh, their bile has been eaten and their gallbladders have been eaten for three thousand years in China. Is, yeah. Yes, over, over here and then in the back. Evaluate uh, the work of journalists in places like the science section of the New York Times. And if, I mean, I have found, as my name is Stephanie Reich, and I try to be a quasi informed layperson, and I have found many of their articles to be very informative. But what is, what would your evaluation be about A, how well do they do to? combat disinformation and how well do they interact with other journalists who may be so addicted to balance mm -hmm. that they avoid evidence? Now, I'd say that the New York Times science section generally does a pretty good job. Uh, the problem is, is that there are so few science sections left. Um, only 7%, I think, or less than 7% of the members of the National Association of Science Writers actually have positions in their field. Uh, many of them have to work uh, in other fields or work as science bloggers because newspapers have cut those sections by and large uh, because they're more expensive. Uh, same with investigative journalism sections. Uh, those are the two sections that really have been axed as, as the model of kind of free news on the internet has taken hold. Uh, so it's a big problem uh, because here we are, ironically, living in an age when science impacts almost every big policy issue and science is first of all ghettoized so it never appears on the political pages because editors don't put it there and second of all most newspapers don't have science sections anymore so people are not even being given the information they need to equip themselves yes, sir. Hi, um, my question is really simple what is the role of scientists in this war on science Yes, it's a really great question. Yeah, it's simple and deceptively simple uh, because it's very important. Uh, but, you know, the most important thing I think uh, is to get out and be involved in the community uh, and be out as a scientist uh, because uh, we need to uh, reconnect that severed link between science and society. Uh, and the best way to do that is by personal emotional relationships. Uh, that is uh, how people make many of their decisions and that's what influences many people in their thinking. Uh, and right now, polls show that the majority of Americans can't name a single living scientist even though there are about two million working among us like zombies. <laughs> yeah. Woman in the back. You just touched on the topic I was going to ask you, am going to ask you about. You said touching people emotionally 
and personally. Now, with your association in Hollywood, why not have sexy TV shows that are all connecting the dots scientifically and getting the people to be associated with it, connect them in their homes, do it emotionally because look what's been happening politically recently. Yeah, no, that's a great idea. Um, there's the National Academies, um, National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine actually have a program called the Science and Entertainment Exchange, uh, where they work to do just that. Um, they provide scientists as science advisors to films and TV shows uh, so that they get the science right. And they also have somewhat of an ulterior motive, I think, by um, forming those kind of relationships between producers, writers, and scientists uh, so that they see that scientists are actually generally pretty cool people that are interested in a lot of things, often multi-talented and not kind of the dry, boring, asexual people wearing white lab coats and talking in a monotone in a film strip. <laughs> So uh, I think it is having a positive effect, uh, although still Hollywood has a hard time with science. We have to face it. Uh, it's hard for them to do comedies uh, uh, without making fun of scientists, you know, making them into either uh, uh, idiotic nerds or uh, evil, you know, machinators. Uh, and that's something that uh, I think comes out of that two cultures divide that C.P. Snow talked about and that, and that we're still struggling with right now. It's certainly something that I would like to find a way to, to continue to make progress on. Okay, uh, we have a hand here and one back there, so start here. Two sure. Back there, uh, so I'm studying engineering right now, but I have a strong interest in a future career in science policy. Um, and I, as I've begun to interact with people who advise congressmen on science issues, they're typically with um, a, a public policy or a, a political science background as well. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, you have a perspective of if that should change, or and uh, more largely. Um, what the greatest impediment is internal to the process. You talked a lot about the external forces that are dividing people apart, but internally, how can we mend this relationship and what's standing in the way? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. One thing that I tell scientists when I speak to science groups is call your member of Congress and ask if they have a science advisor. A lot of times they'll say no, in which case volunteer uh, and help them and say I'll put together a team. Uh, even. And the, the thing about it is, is that it doesn't matter what their political party is, if you're providing them with um, the latest objective knowledge impartially, you're doing a great service. Uh, and uh, that's good no matter uh, who the member is. Um, the other thing that I try to encourage is um, taking a nonpartisan approach. And I talk in the book about kind of the structural issue right now and the problem with the way that we do science advice in the United States, particularly the presidential science advisor, which is appointed by the president and therefore is inherently uh, looked upon as uh, biased by the opposing political party. Uh, Sir Peter Gluckman provides a really great example of how to do differently. I actually have an interview and profile with him in the book. He's the science advisor for New Zealand. And uh, he made a great decision early on when he was asked to advise the prime minister. He said, I'll only do it if, we, uh, if I can uh, equally advise uh, the other side. Uh, because I'm there for the government and I'm speaking objectively. And the prime minister agreed. Uh, and they had a lot of problems uh, with uh, morbidity in their teen population, with a lot of drug abuse, a lot of teen pregnancy, uh, suicide, high suicide rates. And they commissioned Gluckman to form a team uh, to get to the bottom of this and come up with some policy solutions. And instead of putting together a team of stakeholders, which would be basically a team of vested interests, each with their own bias, coming together to see what the best biased compromise they can make is, uh, he went to uh, academics and scientists uh, that uh, researched the question uh, impartially. They, it was peer-reviewed both nationally and internationally, and they came up with a number of different recommendations. Um, the fascinating thing was that w through that process, which was very transparent, at the end of it, the prime minister stood up and said, uh, we don't know which of these uh, recommendations are going to work because 
you know, this is a, this is a new problem. Uh, so there's not a lot of history on it. Uh, but based on what we do know, these are the best recommendations and we're going to go forward with them. And he had Glickman on stage with him and they had tremendous support because of that. So the public, I think, has found that really refreshing, that approach. Uh, so as far as it's kind of a conceptual approach to science advice, um, that's, uh, that's what I would encourage. And, but in, in the U.S. system as it is now, uh, reach out no matter the political party of the person and, and offer to serve. Actually, there's a, uh, I know a former uh, Republican congressman from Michigan who mm -hmm. um, tells that pretty much that story as a personal story. He volunteered as a science advisor, ended up as a, a member of Congress. Is that uh, Vern Ellers? Vern Ellers, yeah. Vern is a terrific guy and one of our earliest supporters of science debate. Yeah. In the back. All the way in the back. Okay, uh, sir, I just wanted to uh, know if you felt that uh, it would be inevitable that, the, uh, that science would uh, actually win this war in the long run concerning that, con considering that the earth is finite, its resources are finite, uh, population is exploding, and the needs of the population are, 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 are going to become thorny, uh, and going, it's going to demand scientific answers that, uh, to resolve them, to make life on Earth that much better for humanity and society. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, I'll, re I'll repeat it more broadly. Um, his question was, uh, because of the finite limits of the planet, whether ultimately science is going to win the war anyway, just because we're, going to, we're bumping up against uh, the limits and uh, with uh, our increasing population uh, and the limited pasture or limited field. And I think to a certain extent that's true, although there are a lot of people who question that. Um, uh, a couple of the people that I talked to in the book, Simon Levin and Jane Lubchenco, question that, um, uh, pointing to how science has repeatedly kind of broken that that zero-sum game uh, thinking uh, by uh, innovating ways to increase the productivity of the pasture, of the bounded field. Uh, but I do think that there's a very strong argument to be made that, uh, for th that we're facing a limiting factor. Uh, uh, whether science uh, gets us to a sustainable solution ahead of uh, nature is the open question, I think. And I think we'd all like to uh, manage our own sustainability instead of nature managing it for us, because I don't think that that outcome is going to be a very pretty one. There's a lady here with her hand up. Um, <clears throat> as a lay person, um, I guess my question is, is that I think it's hard. There are th things that we make, scientists make mistakes or they learn different things. Mm -hmm. And I think, and maybe this has to do just with reporting, but there, especially in the area of health or nutrition, mm -hmm. there are claims that people make rather arrogantly. I don't know whether it's based on science or one of these other factors, but then people buy into that. It becomes kind of a fad. Mm -hmm. And then pretty soon you're off to another thing. And what it does is it undermines people's confidence in what they read about science. Mm -hmm. And maybe this just gets back to how science is reported. I think you're absolutely right. A lot of it is how science is reported. What you're talking about there, particularly in the health and the nutrition area, a lot of that, I'd say about 95% of the science that you hear is absolute crap. It's not really science. A lot of it is industry-funded uh, phony science uh, that uh, takes advantage of journalism. And uh, journalists, of course, love to get a... a a sexy uh, nut graph and a nice lead and a great headline. Uh, and uh, I, I outline a couple of cases uh, where um, scientists have worked to expose this uh, by, for instance, uh, doing a phony study about whether or not chocolate would uh, uh, help you lose weight. And using an, a technique called p-hacking, where you sample for all kinds of different variables, and then you, with the advantage of complete uh, 
uh, uh, hindsight, you look through all those variables and you pick the one blip that is statistically significant that gives you a funny argument. Uh, so you have not actually done a double-blind study at all. Uh, you're statistically manipulating it. And then you can say, oh, well, it looked like people who ate chocolate actually lost weight 10% faster. And, of course, you're going to uh, sell a lot of chocolate bars, and, uh, and that's going to be on the cover of People magazine or wherever uh, within a week. So it is a, big, it is a big problem, particularly in the health and nutrition fields and popular press. So the uh, this woman in the, in the purple here. Okay. The, her question addresses what I was leading up to here. Who gets to decide what is the final word on what is scientifically established? On the cutting edge of things, things are fuzzy. Things go mm -hmm. back and forth. I've spent a career working in regulation of toxic substances and you have as you say things that are bogus or you might suspect are bogus and things that aren't but you, in dealing with epidemiology studies their nature is experiments they're uncontrolled and they go up and they go down and mm -hmm. it's a mess and going I, going to the national academies of science engineering and medicine they can do a damn good job of going to experts and getting a balance of biases and all the rest. But at the same time, science has gotten so complicated and so specialized that for a scientist in one area to make judgments about results in another, is not easy and I think for mm -hmm. instance this business about the GMO crops and the and feelings about that mm -hmm. within it is really 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 hard to expa explain to an educated layperson mm -hmm. who is convinced that business you were saying about fear of Absolutely. hidden dangers, and I must say that I have not as yet been successful in doing so. Yeah, well, you, your comment and question touch on a lot of, of important things. One is that uh, in the absence of knowledge, we often default to fear. Um, that, for instance, happened, speaking of, uh, I guess our engineer left, speaking of engineering with, um, Xi Jinping, um, who was arrested by the FBI uh, last year for uh, giving pocket heater design to uh, the Chinese, which was classified, except that it turns out that it wasn't a pocket heater design at all. And the FBI uh, failed to um, do the science necessary, the, the, uh, educate themselves necessary to determine that and instead fell back on essentially was kind of a racist bias. Uh, the same thing happened to Ahmed Muhammad in, in, uh, outside of Dal in Irving, Texas. Uh, the kid who you know, brought a clock, he designed a school, and, and the police thought it was a movie bomb, they said, and arrested him be largely because he was a Muslim kid with electronics. Uh, so when we don't understand, that's when fear and bias and racism sometimes in the form of bias often take over our thinking. Uh, and then the other point that you made is that science is often, you know, when, when you're on the frontier, things are not well defined. It's not clear or obvious. This is hard. And a lot of times it is fuzzy and things that may seem certain or well established now uh, are shown that there are not so certain down the road. Um, this highlights actually a very important problem in my mind, which is our reward structure in publishing. And uh, the, the answer is getting a variety of points of view on this, having a bunch of people seek to confirm current knowledge. And this has particularly been highlighted in the social sciences, but I think it's a problem in the physical sciences as well, that there is not a lot of incentive for uh, me, if I'm running a lab, and, and to, to go out and uh, do an experiment that reconfirms something that Betsy published on three years ago.
I'm not going to get any citations from that, so I'm not going to get any uh, new funding from that. Uh, and we have a problem because a lot of times studies are out there that are only based on, you know, published only based on one study or, or one set of experiments, and we don't know uh, as solidly as we should. So we've got, you know, science is an imperfect, uh, imperfect mechanism, but it's uh, still the best one we've got. Uh, and the fact that we can have these conversations about it and how to make it better is part of what makes it so robust. So, okay, I was going to say one last question, but I see two hands. So if they're short, make um, you can ask each of you can ask a question, and then we are uh, adjourned after that. Okay. So I was intrigued by what you said about the humanities and being underfunded. Um, oh, and, and those folks are perfect for showing the wonder and the beauty of science and really getting to the gut response of people. So what do you say to the humanities folks to bring them in on, to fight on our side of the war of science? What, what can we do to help them along? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Well, one of the things that I try to do is to point out the ways that uh, when taken to a, an extreme, the, idea of post, the ideas of postmodernism are wrong and are actually work to favor authoritarianism instead of the opposite. Instead of disempowering, uh, or instead of empowering disempowered groups, they, are, they wind up creating uh, the opposite effect. Um, the other thing that I try to do is uh, talk about, for instance, uh, the great opportunity for team teaching things like science civics um, and talking about the way that we evolve knowledge and going back through some of the history that I talked about today that's just fascinating stuff uh, that touches on so many big, big questions about uh, what is the basis of law? You know, well, how did we arrive at common law? And, and how does that relate to religion? And how did the word scientist come out uh, by comparison with artist in 1835? And why did that discussion happen? It was suggested by a poet, actually. Um, so there are all these fascinating uh, interrelationships between science and the humanities and the arts, and in a way, science is an art. In fact, it was considered an art until it was defined as science at that uh, meeting of the uh, London Academy of Sciences. Um, so I think that by going back, asking those big questions, and, and encouraging people to reach out and bridge that, that uh, divide, C.P. Snow's Two Cultures Divide, um, and team teach on this and explore together, we can do a lot. There's a tremendous uh, professor that I had uh, in college um, that, uh, r Professor Kim, uh, that ran, Sunkyu Kim, he ran a, a thing called, I think, Physics for Poets, or, or maybe it was called Cosmos back then. I've been back to teaching it, and Lawrence Krauss has been there, and, and the first time when I went there, I got to go to the airport to pick up John Wheeler, the guy who just, you know, named, coined the term black holes, and all these amazing people, and, uh, and it was the most inspirational thing, because he was getting at those core questions of what is life, and what is it all about, and that's how to capture people, I think, is go for the imagination. So thank you for that. Okay, last question over here. I am a science communicator, and I, I see some reason for optimism in some of the rise of the blogs and citizen science, and I think the genuine sense that geek means cool now, whereas when yeah. I was a kid, geek meant not cool. Right. Um, so I wonder if, I mean, the war on science sounds very pessimistic and doom foreboding. Is there reason for optimism? Are there changes that you see happening that um, we can look to for... Yeah, a source of happiness and joy yes. in the future. <laughs> yes, thank you for that. Yes, as I got, thank you. Did, did you, were you plant? <laughs> uh, there is absolutely reason for optimism. Uh, the human spirit is endlessly resilient and uh, innovative. And, um, uh, but we have to identify what the problem is before we can work to solve it. You know, that's that old, I think, AA saying. <laughs> and in a certain ways, it's, uh, it applies to anything where uh, we have to name a thing and make ourselves aware of it and its complexity before we can strategize around sol solutions. Uh, and that's what I'm attempting to do here with a striking title. Uh, and I do get into many solutions at the end of the book. I think that 
uh, the generation that uh, the millennials uh, have a fundamentally different view uh, on many of these topics. Uh, much of this is driven by a certain uh, uh, focus on the self that they just don't have at the same level, partly because they've grown up uh, tied to one another with social media. So they do have an experience of reality that is uh, in part um, much more uh, community oriented uh, than some of us in the older generation. And to that extent, I think that they're more focused on issues of justice, fr uh, frankly, uh, than they are on issues of self-opportunity. And uh, that gives me reason for hope. So I think that uh, since to the extent that science is a force for justice, uh, and to the extent that uh, being pro-science and being a nerd is cool, especially in that young generation, I think that we've got a lot to look forward to. Okay, join me in giving a, a warm thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And please thank my co-conspirator, Al Tight. Uh, yes. I will plug the book um, at this point. Uh, this is a bargain, by the way. Twenty-one fifty, and they're selling it for my, my textbook, which is now out of print after forty years, was selling for one hundred and twenty-eight dollars. Yeah. So buy this. Yes. Uh, buy five of them. You know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he was asking if I'd sign in. I will. Uh, I'll, actually, I'll just stay here, and they've got some for sale outside, and. Um, hopefully they'll have enough. If not, I think that you can pre-order it, but I'll certainly sit here and sign uh, any copies that you guys have. Thank you again for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. Or we can see it intuitively. Uh, there's no arguing with it. The next firmest form of knowledge is demonstrative. For instance, uh, a feather and a penny fall at different rates. Uh, I put them in a vacuum tube, I suck out all the air, and then they fall at the same rate. Therefore, I can conclude that air has an effect on the way that gravity acts on these different objects. So that's, I built that up from intuitive knowledge made a deduction or an induction, uh, did an experiment, and combined them all to create demonstrati demonstrative knowledge. And finally, his third was sensitive knowledge. I smell a rose. I look around for a rose, but I might be deceived uh, because I might just be smelling perfume. So sensitive knowledge, our common sense, was the least reliable form of knowledge, the kind that most often deceived us, the weakest. And anything that fell short of one of these was but faith or opinion. In other words, anybody could argue about it. Much like we have varying factions in, political, in the political sphere arguing endlessly with one another now that science has begun to break down in society. So finally, to guard against that, he said that every argument should be argued in a way that was similar to a mathematical theorem, uh, grounding the mind or bringing the mind to the source on which it bottoms. And that's what Jefferson really sought to do in in uh, writing the Declaration of Independence because his life uh, really hung on it. And it was really these essential ideas combined that led to the core functioning idea that informed the United States, which was that if anyone can discover the truth for him or herself using the tools of reason and science, then no pope, no monarch, no wealthy lord has any more authority to govern us than we do ourselves. And that was an argument for a crowdsourced enlightenment reason to support uh, this new form of government called democracy. Without science, the United States would not have been here. So our whole system is dependent on this kind of thinking. Now Jefferson himself fell into common traps and thought uh, that we all fall into. Habit, this kind of thinking is not intuitive. It's difficult. Uh, here's an early draft of the Declaration of Independence. And you'll notice that in the top of the second paragraph, he wrote, we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable. 
that all men are created equal. That doesn't sound quite right, does it? What he was doing there was he fell into a mistake, a mistake of thinking uh, in appeal to the divine. We hold these truths to be sacred and, and undeniable. The moment he did that, he opened the United States up, the argument up to anyone who had a different faith to argue that no, theirs was the more sacred and un un undeniable truth. They had a greater authority. He violated John Locke's idea of knowledge. Benjamin Franklin, who was our leading scientist at the time, took a look at the draft, he gave it to him, and Franklin made those backslashes, that edit. And that's Franklin's handwriting, writing in the words, self-evident, which he was quoting from his friend David Hume. So in this edit, it's arguably the most important edit in the history of the United States because it narrowly circumscribed democracy as a secular form of government that was independent of and non-judgmental towards religion. It did not make a religious appeal and neither did it judge religion. So in Jefferson's thinking then, democracy really had a virtuous circle. It began with some governance issue. Then we would turn to the educated and informed mass of the people from whom we would draw the uh, Congress. And that educated and informed mass of people would commission scientific research as Jefferson did uh, with the Lewis and Clark expedition to build knowledge about that governance issue. And then based on that knowledge, Congress would debate the best policy response. That's the way it was supposed to work. But what's been happening over the last uh, 40 to 50 years, and I'll show you how exactly and why, we've had some corruption of that process. Instead of the educated and informed mass of the people, vested interests seek to provide alternative theories to children and propaganda to adults. For instance, uh, seeking to teach that not evolution, but creationism is really the way that uh, human beings came to be. Then, based on that, instead of turning to scientific research to build knowledge, we turn to authority and ideology for knowledge. As much as Representative Shimkus was when he was waving that gilded scientific report. Then, instead of debating the best policy based on that knowledge, we debate it based on dogma. And that's a formula for transforming democracy into authoritarianism. Because at that point then, who writes the dogma? The person with the biggest megaphone. Instead of turning to knowledge that any one of us citizens can generate, we turn to received wisdom from those already in authority. But this is not a conservative or progressive problem in specific. Science is not partisan, but science is always political. And that's a really important distinguish, uh, distinction to keep in mind. There are democracies which have traditionally been associated with science, with freedom, with free thought, with critical thinking, with individual rights, all of those things that seem to have been associated with science. There's something happening that's quite odd here. And that's what uh, this exploration uh, tries to get at. Uh, and the best place to start is really understanding why it matters. So science, as I said a moment ago, is really the great equalizer. It is the one thing that stands between, say, two brothers with as much power as these two brothers have, Charles and David Koch, uh, and two brothers that have as much as these two have, my nephews in Chicago. Now, in theory, uh, these two sets of brothers uh, in the United States should have uh, the same access to justice, the same access to uh, potentially to education or to employment, uh, or at least to voting. Uh, and science is the one equalizer that neutralizes the vast size of the megaphone of the brothers on the left side of the screen uh, and provides an opportunity uh, to the brothers on the right. This is based on some core ideas that really date back to the very, very founding of the United States. Thomas Jefferson said, wherever the people are well informed, uh, 
they can be trusted with their own government. And there is really the crux of some of the problem that we're running into. If you uh, have ever been down to the Library of Congress, you will have seen probably uh, Thomas Jefferson's library that's recreated there. Nice round space, round bookcases, and which contained uh, virtually the entirety of human knowledge at the time. And he had read all of those books and contained that in his mind. He was a scientist and an attorney, uh, sort of like Francis Bacon was. Uh, and that was a possible idea back then, the well-informed voter. But what happens now, nearly a quarter, cent, uh, nearly a, a quarter millennia later, uh, when science has continued to advance and it's not at all possible for one person to know even a fraction of all that there is to know, how do we have well-informed voters that are able to govern themselves successfully in a democracy in the age dominated by complex science and technology? That's the rub that we're bumping up against. Well, in order to come up with this idea for democracy, to convince other Enlightenment nations to not intercede in the Revolutionary War, Jefferson reached for the greatest thinking of what he called his trinity of three greatest men to come up with an argument that would convince him to stay out. He went to the thinking of Isaac Newton, uh, inventor at the time of physics, who said a man may imagine things that are false, but he can only understand things that are true. And this is part of where we're getting into trouble today. Because if you take out your cell phone and turn it over and unscrew the Phillips screws that are on the back, wait a minute, there are no Phillips screws on the back. It's hard to have know-how. It's hard to understand things that are true when science and technology have become so complex that it's difficult for the average person to break them down. A generation ago, you could sit down at your uh, kitchen table and you could buy a kit and you could make a radio. That's no longer true with cell phones. So at the moment that, that cell phones, which like flying brooms are made by people cloistered away wearing long robes and uttering strange incantations, right? At the moment that science becomes indistinguishable from magic, we become vulnerable to disinformation campaigns because science, by its very nature, must become, uh, in a way, a function of belief. And it's what do you believe in? Scientists choose to believe in journals and the peer review process. But even those are vulnerable, as we've seen lately, uh, from certain for-profit journals and journals for hire. Jefferson next turned to Francis Bacon. Like him, both a scientist and an attorney, the Attorney General of England, who sought to circumscribe the power of the king, of the monarch. Uh, and uh, he ver worked very hard to build a lot of the core ideas uh, that, that Jefferson relied on in creating democracy. And he said that what a man had rather were true, he more readily believes, which is one of the reasons that he worked hard to create inductive reasoning and the method that we came to call uh, Western science, drawing of course on Ibn al-Haytham and, and other Muslim scholars that had uh, worked on, on developing observational based science before that. But he saw that as a way to guard against confirmation bias, our tendency to see what we want in the environment. And instead of starting like Descartes did, from the top down, our thinking, I, I think therefore I am, start with nature and see what nature has to say about it and confirm your observations there and build up from that. And then Jefferson turned to uh, a man that conservatives really uh, appreciate these days, John Locke. And John Locke, uh, aside from his uh, uh, conservative, uh, by today's standards, credentials, also uh, was seeking to solve a problem. He looked at all the uh, factions of Protestantism that were uh, happening that had broken down and were arguing with one another over who had the true path to God, who had the real knowledge. And he decided that there must be a way to really know what is real, what is knowledge, versus, as he called it, but faith or opinion. So he came up with three tests, intuitive knowledge, things like two plus two is four, you know, or that, here we go, we've got two and two, put them together, that's, that's something that when I was a kid, for instance, uh, would not have been tolerated. Somebody made a statement that was blatantly, that blatantly flew in the face of what we know from science, 
that would pretty much be the end of their political career. That doesn't happen anymore. And the reason that it doesn't uh, leads us to a curious examination of really what is going on in American politics and why that could be. What has changed in the public and the public's view of science to make that possible? Now, it's not just happening on the right, uh, although many uh, in the science community seem to think that it is, uh, but uh, it's also happening sometimes on the left, and I'll show some examples of that. Uh, Bernie Sanders, for instance, has the most aggressive climate plan uh, of all the candidates for president and is broadly uh, embraced and supported by climate scientists. Uh, at the same time, though, he's against nuclear power, uh, he supports alternative medicine, uh, and he's for GMO labeling, all of which have nuances uh, and elements of them that are not anti-science, but that are informed often by a lot of anti-science beliefs, like the idea, not supported by science, that genetically modified crops are not healthy to eat. This isn't just happening in presidential races, it's also happening in Congress. Consider uh, Congressman Shimkus, uh, who's chairman of the House Subcommittee on Environment and the Economy, uh, in, as he's uh, participating in this hearing on climate change. The earth will end only when God declares it's time to be over. Uh, man will not destroy this earth. This earth will not be destroyed by a flood. Um, and I appreciate having panelists here who are men of faith, and we can get into the theological discourse of, of that position, but I do believe God's word is infallible, unchanging, perfect. Uh, two other issues, Mr. Chairman. Today we have about 388 parts per million in the atmosphere. I think in the age of the dinosaurs where we had most flora and fauna, we were probably at 4,000 parts per million. There is a theological debate that this is a carbon star planet. Now, I don't know how many of you noticed the gilded scientific report that he was waving in his hand there, but the question is uh, why uh, in a committee hearing uh, where we are discussing matters of national import, uh, presumably uh, talking about evidence, uh, is he waving a Bible to begin with? Uh, why go to ideology instead of evidence? And why is that a, uh, an authority uh, in this particular case? Uh, my father read the Bible to our family when I was a kid over the dinner table for about a year, and I don't recall the part about carbon in the Bible. <laughs> Maybe I just missed it that day. Uh, this is all happening, also happening in, in state legislatures across the country. Here's a rather famous example from a couple of years ago where the North Carolina legislature banned sea level rise. Uh, <laughs> this was essentially uh, a move, uh, again, uh, in the climate war. Uh, and, uh, but it's a problem because it was more reminiscent of, say, Mao's China than uh, the United States, where uh, local officials had to go to the uh, state legislature and the central state uh, government in order to get approval uh, and use the numbers that they provided, not actual numbers from science, when making zoning decisions, uh, roadbed height decisions, and things like that uh, uh, in development uh, close to the ocean. Uh, this is also happening uh, in city governments. Uh, for instance, uh, Snowmass uh, last uh, summer uh, banned fluoride, the use of fluoride, over concerns that it, uh, it might be a, a bad for your health. Uh, CDC considers it one of the greatest public health advances of the 20th century. Uh, it's not just in the United States, though. Uh, Anti-science like this, uh, beliefs or, or public policies that are con completely contradicted by the evidence is really spreading worldwide. Uh, Canada, during the Harper administration, uh, who patterned uh, uh, a lot of their policies on some of the Bush administration policies uh, by limiting what scientists could say and, uh, and their interactions with the press and placing ideological appointees over them and closing uh, libraries and scientific uh, enterprises uh, it engendered a demonstration uh, on their Capitol Hill in Ottawa uh, uh, talking about no science, no evidence, no truth, no democracy. It was a mock funeral for uh, democracy and science. Uh, but uh, this, is all, this also has happening in Australia where uh, cities uh, representing uh, about uh, half a million people have recently banned fluoride in France where there are new outbreaks of measles because of the low vaccination rates over fears about 
autism. Uh, the United Kingdom uh, also has a resurgence of problems with uh, the anti-vaccine movement. The United Kingdom is, of course, the birthplace of the anti-vaccine movement. Uh, Poland and Germany, where there's a resurgence of teaching of creationism in uh, public school uh, science classes. Uh, Ireland. Uh, where Dublin also banned fluoride. Israel, where the health minister, who does not have a background in science, uh, recently banned fluoride for the entire country. Uh, Nigeria, where, of course, groups like Boko Haram, uh, whose very name means Western knowledge is forbidden, uh, are reacting uh, in, a, uh, in their version of a right-wing uh, reaction against science. Uh, and China, uh, where there's a burgeoning environmental movement, uh, and uh, at the same time, a burgeoning movement against uh, genetically modified crops, which are seen as some kind of stocking horse from the West. So why is this spreading? Particularly, why is it spreading throughout uh, many times uh, Western... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. <laughs> okay. Let's get started. Um, I'm Al Tyke. A uh, research professor here at the Center for uh, International Science and Technology Policy at George Washington University's Elliott School, which is where you are now. And I want to welcome you on behalf of our center and the uh, Center for Science and Democracy of the Union of Concerned Scientists. They are co-sponsoring this event together with uh, George Washington University. Um, Sean Otto, our speaker here, is an award-winning science advocate. He's a writer. He's a man of many talents. I really uh, get to know him. He's quite, a, quite an impressive guy, um, a writer, a teacher, and a speaker. And he's a co-founder of uh, sciencedebate.org, um, for which he received the uh, IEEE USA National Distinguished Public Service Award. Uh, he's advised science debate efforts in other countries as well. Uh, he's a novelist and a filmmaker. Uh, his uh, novel, Sins of Our Fathers, which is a literary thriller, was a finalist in the LA Times uh, Book Prize. And his film, um, The House of Sand and Fog, which is something I saw uh, actually several years ago before I met John, uh, it's a terrific film, and I would suggest it's, uh, it's available on Amazon and on YouTube, and I would suggest uh, that if you have a chance, you, uh, uh, you view it, rent it, and, and view it. It was nominated for three Academy Awards. Um, it stars uh, Jennifer Connelly and Ben Kingsley, and he was the uh, co-wrote the screenplay for it. Um, his latest book is the one that you see displayed up here and outside on the table called The War on Science, and that's what he's talking about today. Sean lives in, um, in Minnesota uh, and has an environmental house, um, solar and, uh, is it wind powered too? Mm -hmm. Solar and wind powered, and um, as I said, he's a very interesting guy. He's gonna the way we're gonna do this. Sean is going to do a um, a PowerPoint presentation, and then he and I are going to have a conversation, and we'll then open it up to a Q and A, and um, after that, uh, we'll have some time to uh, mingle and enjoy the refreshments that are left. So, uh, without uh, further uh, taking away from his time, let me give you Sean Otto. Thanks, Al. And thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, Representative McCollum uh, let me know that she's not sure if she can make it uh, due to the voting schedule uh, in Congress today. They're trying to move several bills. Uh, but we'll see if she'll be able to join us for the conversation later as well. Uh, 
so as Al mentioned, I was involved in an organization uh, called ScienceDebate.org, which uh, is still around, and I would encourage you to uh, sign on if you have not uh, as a supporter of Science Debate. It's basically a nonprofit 501c3 effort to get the candidates for president primarily, but also other public office in the United States to talk about the big science and technology health and environmental issues that face all of us. And as you'll see from my presentation, this is an issue that is only, only going to grow in importance uh, as we move forward in time. What I've uh, tried to focus on throughout the course of this is bridging a gap that exists uh, in large part between uh, what we're able to do uh, with science uh, and our ability to think and talk about it in our public policy process. Uh, and so that's uh, essentially kind of what the War on Science uh, started out, uh, it grew out of that effort. Uh, the book is really an observation on the core relationship between science and democracy. Science is a great force for equality, uh, and if you care about justice, you have to care about science and the democracy. Uh, and uh, it's uh, an effort to defend democracy from uh, a rise in authoritarianism. So uh, a number of people wonder uh, if there really is a war on science. At the American Association for the Advancement of Science meeting last fall, there was a, a panel questioning that. And I would put, I would, would spoiler alert, yeah, yes, there is. <laughs> There's a war on science right now. Uh, and, uh, and I'd like to give you some examples from our politics. Politi politicians, by the way, are not causing the war on science. Uh, and, uh, and for reasons I'll explain in a little bit, science is not partisan here, uh, but they are uh, certainly participating in it. Two years old, two and a half years old, a child, a beautiful child, went to have the vaccine and came back and a week later got a tremendous fever, got very, very sick, now is autistic. So anti-science politics like this somehow, over the course of the last 20 years, have become completely acceptable in, uh, in American public dialogue. The reason is that science creates knowledge. And as Francis Bacon said, knowledge is power because it gives you the ability to act in the real world, to change the world. And when you do that, you are going to either confirm or disrupt somebody's vested interests. And that is always a political process. Also, new knowledge about an issue, for instance, when and how life begins, causes us to refine our moral, ethical, and legal and policy codes in order to respond to that new knowledge. And that is inherently a political process as well. So there is an economic disruption and an ideological disruption that science often poses. And we'll see that that is driving much of what we're experiencing right now. So instead of a left-right continuum of politics, I would invite you to think about politics more as a plane with uh, certainly a left-right continuum between left-wing and right-wing uh, and also a top-down continuum between anti-authoritarian and authoritarian. Science is never partisan because it is both conservative and progressive. A scientist is always going to research what has been established before, that tradition, if you will, before they publish on something or they could embarrass themselves. But they are also always going to be open to the frontier where new knowledge is happening, the progressive end of things, because that's how you make your career. So it's about protecting yourself and making your career. You have to be both. But science is decidedly an anti-authoritarian occupation. It takes nothing on faith by its nature. It says, show me the evidence, and I will judge for myself. So science does take a position politically, though not in a partisan way. Now, if you think about American politics in terms of this plane, it becomes possible to imagine that there could be such a thing as a liberal conservative. And in fact, there once were. Uh, and there probably still are. It's just hard to talk right now if you're a liberal conservative uh, because we are so used to hearing about these things as opposite ends of a spectrum. But liberal really means uh, open to evidence, open to exploration. Uh, and, uh, and conservative uh, is not exclusive of that. 
What I would argue is going on in American politics right now, particularly in the Republican Party, is more of this argument over authoritarianism and the rise of authoritarianism. Uh, and those who uh, uh, view policy as being dictated by authoritarian sources and those who don't. But this isn't just happening on, for instance, climate change or vaccines or evolution. It's happening on a wide range of topics uh, that are emerging because of emerging science. Uh, this globe with all these blue lines uh, represent Facebook connections. Uh, you'll notice, for instance, that China is dark. We call that the Great Firewall of China. They block Facebook. Um, but uh, they might as well represent uh, connections between scientists working over the internet uh, who are no longer geographically, geographically constrained to work in the same lab in the same location at the same time. At the same time, we have vastly increased the number of scientists working through our university education system uh, in the last uh, 30 to 40 years. So now we have a vast number, an increase in the number of scientists and a vast increase in the quality of their working together to the point that over the next 40 years, we will be creating as much new knowledge as we have since the beginning of the scientific revolution. And if you think about that, and you think about some of the issues listed in this slide, and how many of our past scientific discoveries have engendered large political discussions and conflict and gridlock because of the moral and ethical implications they've posed or because of the economic disruptions they've posed, uh, we could be in for a very rocky next half century. And we certainly need to find a new system, a better system, even incorporating complex scientific information into our policy dialogue in a democracy, uh, the system is starting to break down and we need to find a new strategy. So the question emerges, are the people still well enough informed to be trusted with their own government? Is, uh, th this picture works particularly well with both signs, I think. You need them both. Um, this guy uh, is going to be voting on all of these issues. And it becomes easy to see uh, that we have an issue with outreach, with education, uh, with that well-informed voter. Uh, judging from Congress, uh, there they are, all working hard on their laptops. The answer is probably not. Of the 535 members of Congress, there are only 11 of them that have a professional background in science. It's according to the Congressional Research Survey. Uh, one microbiologist, one physicist, one chemist, and eight engineers. I know some of the pure scientists in the room might take issue with the eight engineers. Randy, I'm sorry, but I'm not going there, except for a cheap joke. Uh, by comparison, how many do you suppose are lawyers who mostly duck science classes in college? Huh? 400? <laughs> <laughs> wow, <laughs> we got some cynics in this audience here. Uh, but you're not far off, sadly. It's 211, or 40%. 40% of Congress are attorneys. Now, this is important because attorneys approach problems of fact in a distinctly different way. They use science 